much more domination by this host um, contribution, and it's not quite as redshifted as you have at high redshift or at high distances. Um, you get a lot more scatter away from this pure um, IgM dispersion line. And of course, the actual host contribution might range from something like 50, like people are thinking with gas catalysts, up to even thousands if there's a very dense medium or if it's sitting in the center of a, a star forming galaxy. So in reality, all of these points could completely scatter off of this line and kind of live in a very big region around here. Um, but if there is a, a really sizable host contribution, you can see that generally the red shift distribution shifts quite a bit lower. Um, I also note that here's this little star as the repeater. These colors are indicating different, um, different instruments. So the blue ones are parks, the red ones are ASCAP. You can see ASCAP preferentially is detecting lower DM bursts. Parks is preferentially detecting slightly higher ones. And I'll get back to that later. Um, but you can actually see the repeater here. We actually know the redshift of the repeater. We've measured what we think is its host contribution or its maximal host contribution. This is about 200. And interestingly, these 100 and 300 lines kind of bridge that, that repeater. So it seems to be sitting in about the right place for what we would expect for a 200 DM host and just a purely, purely ionized IBM. So I think this, this, um, this exercise really highlights um, the importance of understanding where FRBs are in the universe. It'll tell us a lot of information about the media that the FRB travels through, and also what is making FRBs, so what is, what is around them. Um, and the two questions which I think people like to say to the frame this field at the moment is really what are FRBs? What, they do? what is the actual physical process that creates this coherent emission, but also is it a pulsar? Is it a supernova? Is it something else? Um, but also, what can we use them for? So we don't necessarily know that we can use them for cosmology if they're all in the local universe. Um, and in fact, talking about interferometers, I think really the ultimate question that we're trying to answer in the next few years is where are fast radio bursts? Um, and those questions break down into a few other questions. Some of them have just broken that into, you know, what is actually a progenitor of FRBs? What's the phys physical process that makes them? Those two questions are going to be answered in slightly different ways. And here on Earth, of course, we want to know how we actually design a FRB telescope to do the best science for FRBs. And even that question is not totally clear right now. So I'll address a little bit of that today. Um, and I think what we need and the basic measurements we'll need will change with time. This is a huge list here. I'll just read some of them really quickly. Um, but I thought these were all the measurements that I could just think of the other day when I was trying to consider, you know, what, what will actually give us the information about it's making FRBs. So obviously polarization tells us a lot about the media. These pulse substructures that we've been seeing with the repeater um, seem to contain a ton of information about propagation or about the, um, the source and the generator itself. Um, everything from repetition rates to differential source counts, looking at their luminosity distributions, of course, multi-messenger evolution of the source. Many, many different measurements will be done to reveal FRB generators. And of course, accordingly, there are a ton of telescopes being developed and systems being developed on existing telescopes worldwide that will answer all of those questions. And all of these will have unique contributions um, in fully characterizing FRBs over the next, say, I don't know, 10, 20, maybe 50 years. BRBs are still around, so FRBs should be to the same time scale. So you get stars here if you, if you detected a, a blind FRB. It's fine. Um, but the point I wanted to make. And this sort of ends my really general intro. Um, the point I wanted to make is that really over the next few years, we are here now, and we need, we need to figure out a few things in the near term to understand how to proceed with FRBs in the longer term. And I've tried to whittle down this list to just really three basic measurements that I think will give us a lot of information about what FRBs are, what the physical process is, even how, 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 how we need to design our telescopes to find them. Um, but also how we can use fast radio bursts. So obviously distance distribution is really important. This gives us things like how bright our FRBs, how much energy is actually coming out of them. Um, it can tell us things about, um, we want to know things about the host environment to try to understand what types of um, molecules are around for FRBs to use, what kind of beasts live in certain types of galaxies um, that FRBs are coming from. And of course, understanding the X-ray, optical and multi-wavelength multi-messenger evolution before and after 
first. And I would argue that, in fact, each one of these three, what I consider really critical measurements to the field, um, require a post identification. Um, and people like to draw connections with camera ray burst field. And I just took this, uh, this quote from Tree Paul Carney's paper in the recent nature of astronomy focus issue on FRBs. Just read it. And so the key lesson from, FR, from PRBs is the lack of a distance scale led to decades of speculations, little lasting value. Uh, the great revolution in GRB astronomy can be directly linked to globalization. Um, and I, I like that because it supports my cause, but also because I think it's true. Um, and the key in GRBs is that it was very unclear how distant they were at first. They weren't localized. Um, they were isotropic across the sky. People thought maybe they were all galactic. There was this big debate about extra galactic versus galactic, where you had to go into a conference and like actually get pins like galactic versus extra galactic and wear them and support your side. But um, in effect, you know, there are at least two extra galactic populations of PRBs, and that also confused things. The luminosity function of PRBs is very broad. So that also confused things. And really it was a localization that started to make clear links with, um, with um, the multi-messenger phenomena, particularly firstly multi-wavelength phenomena, but also just with certain types of group galaxies. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so there's a couple of <coughs> things that single dish instruments just can't do very well. And I don't mean to slam on single dish instruments because they gave me a PhD and they gave me some great postdocs. And moving on. So single dish does some great things. They often have a pretty good field of view, especially if you put a big feet up there to get um, the full um, the full field of view of your, your instrument. Um, but of course, the position error for a single dish relies on just the beam pattern, which basically gives you an error region within the full attack maximum of the power pattern of your telescope. So some showing the antenna response. And you can see that it changes a little bit with, with frequency. So there's a lot of galaxies in a fairly large air region, and you really can't get much better than arc minute resolution with single visions, even with something like air Um, You do a little bit better with a really high signal to noise. There's an unpublished, seem to be published, FRB at parts that was signal to noise of like 5,000. It's really insanely bright, but we can still only arc localize it to two um, square arc minutes. Um, the other difficulty with this, and a couple of studies have run into this issue, which is that if you have a large area, you can do something like something that you try to be clever and you say, okay, well, there maybe is a rare event that's happening within this large field. And it's rare, and it happens within this field, so maybe there's some probability of association. But even with that, we really don't know what to look for with fast radio bursts. We don't know if they have X-ray. We don't know if it happened 10 years ago or it should happen in 10 years in reference to that actual FRB event. So the actual statistics to associate um, a, a afterglow flare or some kind of multi wavelength um, occurrence in a large error region. Um, the statistics are not very well founded, and you get things like a published um, published correlation with the GRB, which is 3.2 sigma. And this assumes that probably FRBs preferentially have something that happens within 300 seconds after each burst. And even that, once you realize that maybe we should have expected an F a GRB within no, it's 10 days from, from the burst, the statistic goes down a little bit. Um, and of course, there's this famous slash infamous case where we thought we had a host galaxy in this particular FRB, but it turned out that this was just an AGM that was flaring right when the, um, the FRB was happening. But it turns out that this ended up just being a scintillating AGM, which ongoing scintillation happens in a lot of AGMs. And it just happened to coincide with our burst. So large error regions lead to uncertain connections with multi-wavelength associations. Um, and the other slight issue that single dishes have is that you can really have huge errors just in a simple flux measurement. So particularly with parks, FRBs, this has been discussed quite a lot, where we don't actually know the flux density of the parks FRB. And the reason is this, let's say you have your dish, and of course you're pointing at some source, here's the antenna pattern coming out, you have some response in the sky, and off goes an FRB, and you don't know exactly where it's coming from within this power pattern because you just have a single dish, you have no means to localize it. And you can do some clever things if you have a multi beam receiver and say, okay, well, we didn't see it in this one, but we saw it in this one, so we can fit for the position. But even so, you don't really have a good sense of where that position is. 
So in fact, if it's sitting off to the side of your response, what you should have seen, if it was sitting right at the center of your beam, you should have done a really bright and awesome burst. And then what you actually see is this very faint piece of emission with some kind of peculiarly induced spectral index. And the reason for that is that you're sitting off center, the beam response is frequency dependent, so you can get an induced spectral index in the burst. So we don't really even have a good handle for at least half of the population that we have right now, um, because most of them have been discovered with single bridges. Um, yeah. So of course, most FRBs at parks are probably brighter than they appear to be with the single measurement that's given at parks. So we did localization. I think that's, that's well established. Um, and this gets you a number of great things. It gets you accurate fluxes and, and spectra because you know exactly where it's coming from. You know exactly how bright it is. You can model your, your spectrum very well on you know, the calibrator. Um, of course, it gives you distance and redshift if you can identify a host galaxy within, within that localization. It tells you a lot about the environment if you can go ahead and study that galaxy like you've done with the repeater. Um, and also just the typical host types and the ability for detailed follow-up at multi wavelength um, multiple wavelengths. Um, so how, how well do we need to localize? Um, I'd like to answer that with this plot by F. T. Parry's Berger um, from this last year. This is a little confusing, so I'll take some time to, to describe it. So what they've done here is plot out as a function of the magnitude of a typical host galaxy. So say your, your typical host galaxy might be a dwarf, it's going to be very faint, it might be a Milky Way type spiral galaxy, star forming galaxy, and it's going to be a little bit brighter, those elliptical galaxies and preferentially sit a little bit lower. So there's some density of galaxies in the sky. Faint galaxies are much more plentiful than very, very bright galaxies. Um, so if you had, say, a dwarf galaxy, you can think, how well do I need to localize this for a typical dwarf in this, this magnitude range to actually be certain that I have a confident detection? And you can see that if you want a 10% confidence detection, you need really kind of a localization of something like, I don't know, a couple of, a couple of arc seconds, two or three arc seconds. If you instead want a very confident detection, then I would say I would, I would probably want better than, than 1%. That's, that's pretty good, but not, not perfect. You really need sub arc second localization to be totally confident that you have an association with that particular galaxy. Um, here's the repeater. Of course, it was a magnitude of 25.1, so it's sitting somewhere up here. And we really needed that sub arc second localization to be sure that it was this galaxy and not that one, that one, that one, or that one, um, that are all in that little region within a couple of arc seconds from each other. So, really, the arc second resolution, the sub arc second resolution could work for this. Now, of course, we do have a maximum DM that FRBs can come from. And this is the 60F Galaxy Redshift Survey. What I wanted to show with this is just something very simple, which is that we, if we have a maximum DM, which equates to a maximum distance that these FRBs could come from, you could think about the density of galaxies on the sky here and say, okay, let's throw out all the warm colors, so everything yellow, yellow to red. And the density of galaxies within some volume limited um, region is going to be a lot less than if you had the entire universe to search. Like that previous plot was showing. So that previous one assumed we had no basically volume cut off for, for searching for an FRB. Get rid of most of these galaxies based on RDM, and we can have a much worse localization region and actually still be confident that we're associating a specific galaxy. And that is what this is showing. And then they went on to analyze the, um, the ionization of the IGM and understand how well can you um, use DM as a maximum DM indicator, like I was telling you earlier, to actually make a cutoff in that we don't need to look for galaxies beyond, um, beyond this right here. And you can see that, in fact, you do a little bit better here. So particularly at low DMs, if you know the FRB is going to be from you know, the local volume, so this is a redshift maximum of about maybe 0.2, um, you can see that, in fact, your, your confidence, so this is the 1% confidence line, comes to actually Quite a lot more arc seconds. So you could even get something like a 10 arc second resolution for a very low DM, like maybe 100 first, and still confidently localize it to a galaxy. Um, this is something you're going to see later. It'll be really important for ASCAP planes in the next few years. Um, so this, the simple point here was, yeah, less than about 
200 parsecs to the centimeter, you need to have an architect of localization. But you really need self architecture for basically all that All right, so just to reset up, recap this setup part of the talk in a more complete way, I just wanted to say what is, what is actually going to take to understand like our first step in FRDs. And I wanted to be a little more specific. And say this is sort of what we're aiming for. This is like all the great work that's been done over the past many years of radio sources and gamma rays. Um, and I'm showing here the DMDS, it's a source count distribution for radio sources. And this is going to be really critical to assess um, source evolution, um, the sensitivity horizon that you have, um, subpopulations. So you can see here there's star forming galaxies and AGM, showing different evolution in this plot. Um, and that doesn't necessarily require precise localization, but it does require actual ac accurate flux measurements. Um, and we, we can't quite get that from parts yet. I'm showing here um, the luminosity distribution. So we really want to get luminosity distribution for our RCs to understand you know, what kind of physical processes could actually be making these. What are the ranges of luminosity they cover? Um, for an analogy with pulsars, of course, we look at pulse distributions. Are they Poussinian? Are they um, like the nanoshaft uh, pulses of the crab or the power law distributed. And that tells you something about what is, what is actually producing that FRB emission itself um, and whether it is, in, in fact, a good analog to pulsars. Um, so for that, we need statistics measurements. Of course, we want to know what the luminosity is. We can't do that without knowing how far the source is. We really want to get a lot of environmental studies. And I'm showing here um, the offsets of gamma ray bursts from their hosts. And this was a study done by Google in 2002. A little bit more about that later. First, we're going to just study environments, but we have to do that by first identifying focus. Um, and multi wavelength data was really clear for gamma ray bursts in showing um, first an association with supernovae um, for the long gamma ray bursts and showing the source evolution of these outflows that were happening. And of course, the recent multi messenger detection of gravitational waves has really made a big step in, in producing really precise models for this happening. So we'd love to do that. And it's not necessary. You don't have to have a really, really good host identification, but it's going to be much easier and you'll have much stronger statistics, as I showed before, if you have a precise localization. Okay, so this is what we want. When do we want it? Now. Okay. But what do we have so far? Right now, we have basically sort of two measurements of the DMD has slope. Um, and one is from ASCAP. And it appears that as cat bursts are following a very, a very steep slope. Um, one is from parks, and as you can see, there's a big range here because there's a lot of uncertainty in the parks fluxes. And it appears to go from something that's not, not quite Euclidean in one way, Euclidean is minus 1.5, and then at, at higher fluxes, at higher fluences, it goes to the other way, not quite Euclidean, it's a little bit steeper at minus two. We have, we have one, one, one burst energy, and it's not too bad for it. We have a start. Um, and in fact, most of this all comes from the repeater because, of course, that's the only localized galaxy that we have so far, localized in FRB host. So we have a pretty, pretty solid environmental study that have gone on with the repeater. Um, and unfortunately, over, overly quiet multi wavelength data. So Paul Schultz has done some great work in trying to follow up the repeater in multiple wavelengths. Um, and of course, the only thing we've seen is this persistent radio source. Talk about that again so a little bit later. And here I just wanted to show really a, a nice example of what we could be doing really in the next kind of year or two, um, depending on what we can localize, the time find a ton of repeaters, and we can localize those um, using you know follow-up, things like that, or using say real fast to discover and localize FRBs. If we're able to localize really just a few fast radio bursts and host galaxies, you can do some really interesting studies. So if you have some arc cycle localization, you can actually show, like they did in these early studies with gamma ray bursts, that in fact, FRBs are possibly offset from the centers of galaxies. GRBs are preferentially offset from the centers. Um, they seem to show an associate, seemed at that time, to sort of association with UV light. Um, and you can draw some pretty, pretty solid conclusions with even just a few localized fast radio so you don't need thousands. Even just maybe 10 to 20 FRBs might be able to show enough that look, all FRBs are coming from dwarf galaxies, 
or half of them are coming from dwarfs, half of them are coming from the Perhaps there's some bifurcation in the population that are a little bit more solid footing than we have right now. Um, and I think this is exactly the sort of study that we'll be seeing in the next few years. Okay, so what will that actually take? Let's talk a little bit about the instrumentation we usually have right now. Um, and I like to break this down, and I think some of you might have seen this plot before, but I love it. Um, but we can simplify this to two axes, axes of practical observing parameter space. The maybe it's really huge so you can see them, they're going to be smaller in the next slides. And this is basically how well FRBs are localized. So really good localization, poor localization, you can see that here. So this is something like a 30, 30 arc minute radius, that's about what parts gets. You can see there's tons of galaxies. This is, I don't know, a couple, couple tens of arc seconds radius, there's a couple of few ambiguous plots in there. So if you get sub-arc second localization, you can even just identify where in the galactic structure the FRB is coming from. Um, and the x-axis here is basically how many FRBs you're going to detect per year. Um, and there's a third axis here, which I think is sky depth, and I'll discuss that more soon later. Um, so for classic interferometry, interferometry, it's really easy to get good resolution. All you have to do is get a longer baseline. Of course, you can also do this a little better with higher, higher frequency or shorter sort of wavelength. Um, but yeah, you want to get a long baseline to get down into this sub arc second region. I don't think anyone has not seen this equation before, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, but it's a little bit more complicated when you want to get into the right side of this plot. And a lot of interferometers have struggled to push themselves to that, that right side. And of course, time does this very well. Because um, what you really need is a lot of collecting area. And what this equates to for your parameters is a lot of elements. So you want to have a lot of actual dishes with surface collecting area to actually be able to be sensitive. But at the same time, you want to couple this with the ability to see a very large field of view. And different interferometers have, have manifested this in different ways. So um, there's a telescope called the Beats and Optic Array, which is basically just using five meter, five meter, but small, just about five meter dishes. Um, to get a large field of view using those as their parameters and just putting a ton of them so that you actually get a lot of elements. Something like ASCAP, this is its field of view, they have 12 meter dishes, but they have um, phase rate feeds sitting at, at the feed. Um, so they improve their field of view in that way, are able to get 30 square degrees um, in this instantaneous coverage. And of course, just spending a lot of time on sky, improving your bandwidth, these can all improve your sensitivity. Um, and of course, you want to get better sensitivity in your SEFT, so beat down your system temperatures, and um, of course try to not have an instrumentally broad impulse. Okay, so I'm going to lay out our current playing field for what actual instruments are, are on the space space. Um, but before I do that, I just wanted to say what I was considering when I'm showing these, these plots. Um, so I like to go around and ask people what their respects are for, for their instruments. So I've gone around and asked a lot of people what their actual measurements are. And um, I'm also considering here the constant observing duty cycle. This varies a lot from telescope to telescope. BLA is down about half the time for maintenance or I don't know about testing various things. Um, some telescopes are on almost 100% of the time. They break very seldom. I don't know how they do it. Um, and I'm assuming here a localization of a seven sigma event. Of course, if you had only 3,000 sigma events, you would localize, localize a little bit better. Um, I'm also assuming here a single fast radio burst population, which I say single, this could be multiple, but all I mean is that they're going to be characterized by a given range and scattering pulse width dispersion measure, um, but also this sort of count distribution and spectral index. Okay, so I'm laying out this parameter space for the telescope list we saw before. These are all the ones with the gold stars plus the BLA, in part because I work on it, but also because it's detected in the repeater. Um, and it's currently online searching. You notice that VL, um, sorry, GBT and Arecibo aren't, aren't, aren't on here because they're in fact off the left side of this chart at the moment. That will improve in the future, but their absolute detection rate is less than one per year. Um, but you can see here that Chime is really winning in its field of view, um, and it really gets a lot of detections per year predicted, and I believe actual, based on what Paul was saying. Um, Basically, because it can cover such a large area of the sky at a fairly good sensitivity, it has about the same sensitivity in terms of depth as the parks. And you can see that parks, Malangalo, and ASCAP, Flyzai have roughly um, the same 
of this data that we have today. Okay, so going on into the future though, in only a couple of years, this is gonna rapidly expand to a lot of other instruments. And even some improved facilities, so you see DBT actually sneaks in here when we get um, the multi, um, multi pixel key up onto GBT. And you can see that these really divide into a couple of different um, regions. We're in the upper right of this plot. You're really gonna do a lot of great things with just putting bulk population statistics, detecting thousands of FRBs. So after teeth over at Western Board in China, you'd be doing great for this. Um, identifying repeaters, if you can see a lot of the sky and you can look at it all the time, we'll identify bursts that, that happen again and again. Um, so we're expecting that a lot from both of these instruments. But down here is really where the meat is for doing cosmology and studying multi wavelength posts with, um, with post identification. And the dividing line, I think I had in the previous plot, is this is about the 95% the confidence line for a, um, a 25th magnitude galaxy. So you it's slightly better than two arc seconds, but to be 95% confident. And of course, it gets better as we get lower. Um, so I'm showing here, these are. This is the, uh, the equation I'm using for the, the source count distribution, the NDS to the gamma. So here are just the, the bars here covering horizontally because there's some uncertainty in FRB rates. Um, but also, we don't exactly know what the distributions will be, and that influences how sensitive it will be. Uh, but I can actually narrow this down and say, okay, let's go now and change the source count distribution to have a little bit flatter than you can study. What if all the source counts were flatter than Euclidean? And in this case, you would expect to see many, many bright bursts in reference to the number of faint bursts you had. So you can see roughly, for um, you know, gamma of zero, you'll see roughly the same amount of bright bursts and faint bursts in your data. So, of course, the large field of new instruments, like China and Aberty, as have in the DSA, these all have a pretty big field of view. And for those flat source counts, you really get this big enhancement in your um, detection rates. The VLA has a little bit of trouble as does Meerkat because it only has dishes that can see a finite view of the sky. So if you don't have a steep source count distribution which really accents the faint burst, um, it, it won't really highlight the depth that those instruments can see because we don't, we don't have a wide field of view. Okay, so let's make, make those instruments look better and make the source count as steep as we can make it. In fact, it's not as steep as we can make it, but this is just a Euclidean distribution. I've also, to hand up the VLA a little bit and highlight another point, I've turned on um, the spectral index to be plus two. So this is an inverted spectrum population. Spectral index of FRBs is really not well constrained at the moment um, for reasons I mentioned earlier. But here you can see that these wide field of view instruments are a little bit suppressed in their rates. Um, but the instruments that have a really good depth that can see the very, very, um, very low fluxes do a little bit better. Um, so in this case, of course, PSA 10 does pretty well. The VLA highlights it moves a little bit to the right. Um, your cat does as well. And of course, of course, you turn on a spectral index that rises at high frequency, you get potentially a lot, a lot of um, detections at high frequency. At the moment, we don't really have many experiments running at any frequency above S band, it's two gigahertz. Um, GBT 10, but it's, it's not currently, as far as I know, doing any systematic searches yet. You really see in that what band it goes Yeah, I'm doing the American thing. So L means one gigahertz, S is two, C is five ish, X is somewhere around 10. Um, and we do actually have the potential to search for higher bands up to 90 gigahertz, and they're down off the bottom of this plot, because of course you get better sensitivity. You also get a smaller field of view, so the problem with those is that if you have a very small field of view, you really need a boost in the fluxes to actually detect a lot of FRBs. So I think the first thing that the DLA will be doing is in fact constraining the rates of FRBs at these high frequencies when it turns on the nerves. Okay, so I mentioned there was a third axis to this plot, and I wanted to talk quickly about, um, about that. So I think the, the third axis here is really relates to what population we're probing. So if you're not very sensitive, of course, you're not going to get to a very large distance in the universe before you can't detect FRBs anymore. Um, and this, this effect relates to a paper that was just published 
I don't mean to slam the one, but I've just been thinking a lot about this lately, and I wanted to share it with you guys and see if you have ideas about it. So ASCAP is actually 50, 50 times less sensitive um, than parks. The parks in China and BLA all have rough, roughly the same sensitivity in terms of the actual flux cutoff. And um, Shannon and all, right? Shannon and his collaborators published this paper about the ASCAP FRBs, there were 20 of them, where they were saying that uh, ASCAP FRBs are in blue here. I think red is the um, China, the, I'm sorry, not China, uh, most, and uh, black are parts of FRBs. This is the repeater. They're saying that it appears that there's a fluence and DM um, correlation, and that it appears that FRBs seem to be just following the same. Influence DM kind of distribution that might point to DM as a good distance indicator. But I wanted to make a simple point about this. And I'm showing here basically, if you took the parks like field of view, which is about 0.56 degrees, instantaneous with the parks walking in, and you said, How sensitive are we? And we can look at a source after some distance. It doesn't matter what distance, I don't know what the distance is. Uh, but for a given source, say we can look about that far. Turns out that parks, based on its sensitivity compared to ASCAP, can probe a given source to about seven times the distance to ASCAP. So if you have a fixed luminosity, parks can see it seven times as far. ASCAP flies I. Of course, it's not very sensitive, but it sees a huge volume of the sky. Now, the effect of this, if you just run the numbers, is that ASCAP flies I actually sees 500 times the more of the local volume than parks for this given source that we're thinking about. So 500 times more volume in the local universe. So it's maybe not surprising that it's detecting preferentially low DM bursts and possibly ones that are closer by. Um, the other point that's kind of the counterpoint to this is that actually most of parts probe volume, like 99.7%, if you just take the amount of volume probes here versus the rest of parts probe volume. So 99.7% is more distant than that past horizon. Okay, so we can look back at this plot and think about what that would mean here. And to me, this means that parks is going to preferentially not really detect nearby fast radio bursts. It spends most of its time, 99.7 of its volume, looking for more distant events. Um, so this is kind of a low volume zone. I'm sure if parks spent long enough looking, it will find the low DM nearby events. It just hasn't yet given it time. So parks can also see up here because these are the really high luminosity events. If you have a given source bound distribution, just like any survey you do, you cover the whole sky, you'll see a lot of really bright sources. If you cover one little part of the sky, you're not likely to see very many bright sources. So parks isn't seeing them up here because again, it just hasn't looked for long enough at wide enough area of the sky. Or I guess I should say an equivalent time over degrees squared. So the counterpoint to this is that of course, ASCAP also has one of these lines where its sensitivity basically bows out here, so ASCAP can't actually see any of the bursts in this region of the plot. I don't know why ASCAP wouldn't have seen bursts out here, if you guys have ideas about that. It might be a DM selection effect, if for some reason ASCAP can't see my DM bursts, but I can't make that work. Any, any ideas? Since one here, of course, will pay for why Parks doesn't see low DM bursts because of our eye contamination. We yeah. asked about a lot less of that. So, one of those forces is it's the uh, it's uh, it's modified for Parks themselves, but it's, it's a different RFI environment. RFI, yes, yeah. RFI will So, so that's why that, that means you're less sensitive to low DM. The that's gap right. over there at least can be understood, and the other one doesn't. Yeah, but I can understand that gap. So, I guess I'm not following. What, what can you see that you don't have to do with right? Right, high damper. So, there's just some maximal things. Well, I mean, we do see, right, as I see. Yeah, so there might be just some maximal things. That's my other thing. Yeah, that's cool. Past the whole year, that's near by events, maybe or ever, if you don't get enough. Okay, by the way, just to, 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 I think this is a beautiful plot and a beautiful number. It so happens that the, because it's a similar number of events, roughly 20 in each, they happen to pull, if you have put a number then, they happen to pull a similar time volume to each other. So what you know is that um, the ASCAP event is seven times closer, as Sarah said, to the DM, intergalactic should be seven times less on ASCAP. 
Okay. Seven times less means that of the ASCAP events, nothing is in the glass. Right? We know that immediately because we know that in the, it, it's a few hundred over there, so it's like 50, but this is an ASCAP event, so it's negative. So we know that immediately from this plot. So there we also know that the, the typical VM intrinsic must be at least a few hundred, meaning the past events are also local dominated. Okay, this plot immediately derives that. There's no assumption because the same goes, the flow goes. So you already know that the, that the intergalactic VM is part dominant for both populations. And then the details of why ASCAP doesn't have, why Mark doesn't have a low DM and why ASCAP doesn't have a high, I think requires understanding instruments slightly better. It is a bit, it is a bit strange. I think it's a bit strange that ASCAP doesn't see it. And perhaps we understand why Mark doesn't see it. But the other one is kind of water pipe. Okay, so this is like this water pipe. And the DM, I think it's an interesting question. Okay, anyway, so since I mentioned some other instruments here, I wanted to just put them on here. This is VLA. VLA has a very, very small field of view, about 90 degrees. Um, goes a little bit further than far, so it's a little bit more sensitive. Time is the answer. We say no. Um, so here's time. Of course, it has this gigantic field of view. It has about six sensitivity parts. So it will, in fact, probe this very large volume. I also wanted to show ASCAP has been running in flies eye mode. Um, this is ASCAP in its full in earnest um, interferometric mode. It's quasi, quasi interferometric mode, we're doing a beam forming. Um, and you can see it's a little bit smaller volume of time, which goes up to about the same um, depth. Um, so this has also harkens back a little bit to DRV once, DR, DRVs once again, because I, I sometimes wonder, and I haven't done any solid numbers on this, maybe you have love to hear about it. Um, but it seems like the, the nearby bursts that we've been detecting are friendly low DM bursts appear to be more um, variable in their frequency structures. I don't have the counterpoint for the parts bursts, but they tend to be a lot more smooth. This higher DM population um, tends to have a lot less substructures in their pulses. I don't know whether this is because of some kind of lensing effect that's dependent, or whether there is a bifurcation of the populations. I'm not sure what this is. But there does appear, at least based just on these two numbers, at these different points values, um, to be some kind of source, to have some kind of source evolution um, happening in the population. But again, this could be just evolution or it could be evidence of multiple populations. So what is minus two or minus what? What do these numbers mean? This is um, so if you have a the integral source count index. Oh sorry, yeah, this is this, this should be uh, S to the minus two. So so what, wait, where you could be is one point five. That's Euclidean is minus 1.5. Yeah. It's negative 1.5. I didn't do the equation right on these slides, but I'll write it up here. Um, minus proportional to s to the gamma. And so gamma here is yeah, minus 2. Of course, it would be interesting to think what the L bar might be on that, isn't it? On minus 2. On well, each, 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 both of these. Yeah, this one, this is the L bar. This is the one thing. Well, but Macau, so one Macau the claims the same data, right? Macau and Ecos claim on the exact same Bidentum data that the error bars plus or minus two. And the error bar meaning is twice, three times bigger yeah. than those guys' claims on the same data. And this relates to the fact that we really just don't know parts plus really well. And that's why those, those numbers are over. So, so, so in other words, do we actually know? Depending yeah, on the people, that, I mean, I'm just looking at other people's analysis of the same data. I thought they claim that within their public error bars, they overlap. Right? So, yeah, and there's a lot of subtleties in these measurements too about how you get these. And I think the ASCAP one is a little bit more solid just because they have a good sense that have twenty percent error on their pluses. Yes, but they they have allow minus one point five in the paper. Exactly. The Shannon at all allows minus one point five. Is it explicitly? Um, yes, because minus one point three. Yeah, it's, it's about uh, one sigma away from minus one point five. Okay. Yeah, they have really good. They twelve percent. Uh, exactly. Twelve percent means it's like uh, one point one sigmas, um, meaning you know, it's perfectly consistent. And the other one, again, if you take the card, all the last 1.5, meaning at least within the published literature, there are a lot to be consistent. And also, don't you have a hard limit on ASCAP that because we know the DM limit, the DM law is an upper bound on how far away they can be, which is about a redshift of maybe 0.3 or something. They are the kind of happy view Euclidean because the universal point three is hard to make the non Euclidean, so they don't have a choice. Like, yeah, well, I mean, we don't, that's, yeah, I guess right. So we have a DM limit for S caps. Indeed, so exactly. And then there we kind of have to be on the side of the universe that's choice. Well, unless there's some really extreme evolution for some reason in the source population, but that's the same thing. But 
it should be up to average, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what makes it work. <laughs> Okay, anyway, so let's move on and just talk a little bit about a couple of instruments that we have. Um, and I'm actually just going to highlight really two particular projects, which I think are going to be leading um, localization just in the next like, month to maybe a couple years. Um, I'm not going to discuss time very much because Paul has discussed that and many of you know about it. Um, but I think it's great to hear about those outriggers. So it's going to be a great, um, a great capability if, if we can get them rolling. Um, I'm not going to talk much about the deep synoptic array, except that it has been running in a 10 dish, um, 10 dish array. They haven't yet detected FRBs. For some reason, their sensitivity isn't as good as they expected. Uh, but they have now a fully funded plan, 110, um, 110 element um, array that's, that's planned to go in over the next few years. So they have these five meter dishes, five fields of view, and we'll be doing the localization out of the California desert. I'm going to talk a little bit about ASCAP and real fast. I also list down here for those who can't see. There's also Meerkat in the long low TV. The status is unknown to me. I just haven't run into those scientists in a while, and when I do, they don't tell me much. Um, so, just highlights of the, the near future, and this is really like a very near future. ASCAP has now actually begun their interferometric mode. It's showing you their antenna distribution. You can see their largest baseline is somewhere around maybe um, uh, seven or eight kilometers. But of course, they have these phase array feeds that give them this really gigantic field of view um, that files out the primary beam. Um, and they're able to do not only just like a time series search of each of their beams, but they actually save voltage pumps and are able to do a full interferometric correlation of those voltages and do very good, um, possibly arc second localization, especially for um, bright bursts. Um, but certainly, they will be doing at least a maximum of a few arc seconds of resolution for the bursts. And hopefully, if they are still preferentially discovering low DMFRPs with this dedicated array, so it would be a, a full array, um, hopefully they can actually make associations with something like a few arc seconds localization, even if they can't get to the arc seconds of arc seconds localization. Um, that's really ideal. Um, and of course, this is the project I work on. I wanted to highlight it a little bit. Um, and this is a real fast project happening at the very large array. Um, so far, we have a prototype system that's been running over the past few years. We've collected about 400 hours of dedicated line searches. And of course, we also that spent about, this was about 90 hours looking for the repeater and localized it and did some great things. I'm skipping out of our busy week this week to come talk here and hang out with you guys. But this week, we're actually first time turning on our commensal system, which will be running from now until, until the GPU sale, I guess. Um, on the VLA, on every observation that the VLA does, that's continuum observation. Um, so end of the year, this year, will be our official switch on of this system. We're really excited about it. But of course, the, the highlight of real fast is that it runs on the VLA, and even at the smallest configuration, just some, a couple hundred meters, and then its largest configuration, A configuration, goes out to 35 kilometers. So B and C is what we were observing the repeater in. It's kind of like a hybrid array that's somewhere about here. Even with that relatively compact array, you localize the repeater to better than 0.1 arc second localization. So it's really fantastic at doing this really precise localization. And in fact, and we expect that every FRB that we detect will have a sub arc second localization. And just to show it, we actually first detected the repeater when we were doing some prototype commissioning um, back in August 23rd, a couple years ago, a fateful day. So here's our actual real fast candidate plot. Um, you can't see this really well because the, the resolution is very good, but there is the FRB. You can see this nice um, point spread function, this nice star pattern that the VLA gives us. Here's just a zoom in image. That's a five millisecond image. So we actually do a full imaging search. We see this first the visibilities and actually make images for each, um, each time sample and do the same, you know, standard DM trial search. I should mention that Bridget Anderson made these beautiful plots as a summer student. A couple years ago. Um, so here's the actual pulse, too. These are the different polarizations. We have left and right polarization, orthogonal. Um, and that middle one is the combined one. This little time series here showing the pulse. So moving into the future, we haven't had a lot of blind detection yet in 400 hours. So it's very hard to schedule these observations on the VLA in a non commensal mode because it just takes a lot of scheduling. 
it was a sort of non, non standard way of using the telescope because it puts a lot of load on the correlator to test the process and spec samples. We've now been working closely with the um, staff at NRIO to actually get the VLA to be able to run in a commensal mode with a fast sample automatically, stream out the data, and we just take it into our black box real fast and process all the data. So for any continuum VLA observations, we'll be observing from about December onward. And I'm just showing the typical, this is the, the system equivalent flux density. It's pretty good for the VLA. Of course, we have 27 antennae, so that gets even better once we make full images. So you can see that we'll have something on the order of a couple of thousand hours per year searching for FRBs at these different frequencies with the VLA once the system comes on. So we expect to localize somewhere between, you know, depending on the spectral index. Spectral index is, is going up. We're going to be great at seeing next band. So it's going to be probably nominally about three or three to six FRPs per year that are really precisely localized um, the local galaxies. Um, so I'd just like to wrap up this talk by just speaking briefly about um, about actually doing follow up. That was supposed to be part of my talk. Um, and I wanted to bring it back to where we started, which is you know, we want to ultimately answer what is the actual FRB engine? What is the physical process that makes it? Now, particularly, I haven't really talked much about what happens before and after <coughs> the FRB actually occurs. What kind of follow up do we need to do? So, obviously, if we want distances, a really important first measurement just find a host. A very simple thing we need to do. We need to look at either archive data or take new observations to simply take an image of the field. Is there something there? How far offset from that object is the FRB? Very, very simple questions and very simple answers. We have some great facilities to do this. These are about the magnitude limits we can, we can reach for these, um, these three instruments. If these are approximately correct, so we can correct them wrong. Um, but then, of course, the next step is not just to know that there's a host there, to know that the FRB lives in a host. But actually measure the redshift to even get to this list. Um, and I've already mentioned some previous studies, so we're trying to decide well, what's, what's next after we do these two critical measurements. Um, and here's a, a larger version of the plot that, um, that Paul showed, where we actually, for the repeater, were able to get HST data after we identified and got a redshift with identified the host that he was back first, got a follow up with Gemini and the redshift. And then we followed up with HST. He told us something along the lines of, quote, this isn't really urgent, you don't need a DDT, just wait till next round. So this HST, HST data came up clear, reasonably so, because the galaxy wasn't going away. But with this really nice resolution, we were able to localize that FRB to an actual knot of star formation, kind of sitting off center from the galaxy. This blue ellipse shows you the actual galaxy. This is an unrelated source down here. Um, but really, for future FRBs, there's a lot of very simple questions we need to answer. So simply measuring the properties of host galaxies and measuring anything odd, just like we did with this one, it was low metallicity, it was a dwarf galaxy, it was star forming. Um, so our FRBs always in dwarf galaxies. If they're not, our bursts always coincident with UV data or UV um, emission or plus of star formation. Uh, they're always low metallicity. Um, if the next three are in old elliptical galaxies, what does that actually mean? It's a very simple question that we can answer. Okay, non non optical people like me. So what what's what is the ellipse? What is the ellipse? And what what's f one sixty w? And what's so this is just a, a band, um, a band that selects a preferential um, range in, in wavelengths, and I think it's highlighting the h alpha emission. So it, it includes that h alpha band. So it's a red shifted h alpha band. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is highlighting the h alpha. If you looked at this in a more broad broadband continuum. The galaxy kind of shows up in this blue ellipse. The blue ellipse is very yeah, happy. so the center of the galaxy. <laughs> the blob at the bottom is unrelated. Yeah, I think that's a star, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. There's a black and star. Happens to be nearby. Not a star star. Okay, so the other thing is um, there's a lot we can infer from looking at whatever multi wavelength emissions is there. I said before that the only thing we have to go on right now is this persistent radio source from the repeater. Um, but even with such, something as simple as this, this is a paper that's from long coming. I promise it'll be done in the next two years. Um, but you can look at the spectrum of the persistent radio source and try to understand if you model this as a synchrotron emission, um, as we think that persistent radio source is made of, there it is. This is the original Arecibo um, error bars. That's the persistent radio source <laughs> continuum. Flow um, radio image. 
So we can look at the spectrum. The standard, just diffuse synchrotron slope, not optically thick, um, is about minus 0.7. And you can see that this the spectrum of this radio source seems to have a turnover. Um, and I think the, the low frequency spectral index is minus 0.1. Up here, it steepens to something like minus, minus 2, so relatively steep. So it's interesting that if you try to do the proper modeling of is there an absorption turnover at low frequency, it's not shown here, but it does actually turn, turn over quite steeply um, down at 500 megahertz. Um, it appears that there does seem to be some self-absorption there that we see, so that this does have some kind of optical depth as you go to low frequency. It tells you something about the actual brightness temperature of it. Um, the fact that it turns so steeply here um, can be interpreted as synchrotron aging, and if you use this as a synchrotron aging argument, it actually puts this source at something like less than 500 years old. So possibly a relatively recent development, recently developed radio source, which is consistent with in the spectrum with the supernova, also with nebula and radium. And is this worse than the brightest ever detected in the area? Or the brightest? Uh, I don't know if that's true, but it would be on the brighter side, yeah. I think it would be. I can't remember yeah. sure about it. I'm pretty sure it's consistent with any of the energy cubes and staff. I don't know much about it. Yeah, I, don't know, know, I, I think when we last see up here, it's on the order of it's on the order of what I remember for the supernova range, but um I don't think I don't Okay, so I just wanted to show this quickly. This is a grid I'm just trying to put together to organize my thoughts on um, how do we actually organize follow-up and how do we associate or try to rule out different source models. And there's going to be a talk on, on source uh, models this afternoon, but I wanted to just show this grid because I think it really relies the complexity of, um, of what kind of multi-wavelength and multi-messenger emission might come from, um, from fast radio bursts. So one of the most popular models in part because of this persistent radio source, is the idea that maybe 10 to a, maybe a couple hundred years ago, there was a supernova and a gamma ray burst. So way back, years to decades, there was this long gamma ray burst and a supernova. And then over time, all that's left is this little remnant of supernova radio flowing along. Um, and that's all that's left. But you have this repeating FRB that's related to a, a magnetar. And in that case, you wouldn't actually expect to see any concurrent emission with the FRB itself. So it wouldn't really help to see an FRB and suddenly go off and do rapid follow-up. You're not going to see anything. You're just going to see a persistent radio source. Um, <coughs> but of course, the different models all come with different associated emissions. And I've lumped, in some cases, source models um, from a couple different papers into, into one line here. So I don't know. We can take you know, something like a young, pars young pulsar where you, you power the persistent radio source by the spin down. Um, you would even maybe still see an evolving multi wavelength afterglow if it's young enough. Um, you might even see a gravitational wave burst a couple of years before um, the event itself, or a couple of weeks before the, the FRB event itself. Um, you can consider all these different models. But I think there are a few conclusive ties you can make. So if we see coincident gravitational waves with an FRB, we know that absolutely. Thing. There should be two populations. We know the repeater is not cataclysmic. We don't believe it is, based on its repetitions. Um, gravitational waves would probably point to a source class that is, in fact, a large explosion um, and a, a, a very rapid acceleration, which would, would probably point to some kind of collapse um, or opposite direction and explosion. Um, finding neutrinos really would point to beaming or some kind of rapid acceleration um, of those hadrons. Um, of course, the evolving afterglow will tell you a lot about an ongoing outflow or, again, a recent explosion. Um, and you can probably uh, unpack some good information about the, um, the changing electrons in that medium by looking at tracking that outflow. Um, and again, non evolving persistent sources, this might point to some kind of old progenitor population, but old on the order of maybe even just as young as 500 years, as it seems to be with the persistent radio source. Um, in case there are prompt afterglows, it is very hard to do rapid follow-up. We are working very hard, and almost all of the FRB instruments worldwide are working very hard to um, provide real-time triggers. Um, however, of course, 
radio, radio pulses are dispersed so they're delayed. So if there's a concurrent emission at optical or X-ray wavelengths, that's almost always going to happen before the actual radio event arrives first. So there are efforts, and I'm just showing one here. This is the Deeper, Wider, Faster program, which is people in the audience here have been involved in this. Um, efforts to actually do coordinated observing across the world to look for FRBs and simultaneously track the same field at multiple wavelengths with multiple instruments. Um, this is only possible really because there's other science that would go along with this, not just an FRB hunt, but I think it's a really great program that's been coordinated. They also have this really cool worm where they actually like go during the runs and look at the data in real time. It's really fun. Okay, so that ends my talk. I have some very simple conclusions, which that post identification is going to give us a lot about the actual events itself, what creates FRBs, what kind of environments do they live in. Distances are going to give us the critical information about energetics to tell us really what kind of um, science we could do with FRBs. And of course, localization is going to give us all of these things. Yes, so question. So, emissions can't be a frequency, the bandwidth of the receiver matters. If the emission is pumping in frequency, yes. the bandwidth of the receiver matters by the Can you comment about the dog of characteristics of parts and uh, aspects in that direction? You know, I think just, well, so yeah, the. Um, What's interesting is that the repeater has been observed at many different bands, up to X bands, I think, up to eight years. And it remains clumpy in all of the bands, but um, the clumpiness seems to be about the same um, bandwidth for, for most of the bursts, as far as I can tell. Again, this is a FYI assessment. Um, but that's within a, within a particular, I mean. Within a band. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's possible that there are some FRBs that have, you know, preferentially. Small lots like this face that very large separations, and we might be missing the line population, which is possible. Um, if that is true, you know, it's hard to identify. Like, even I was looking at these plots and saying, are some of these actually real, or are they just noise that looks, that happens to have some alignments? Because that does happen. We get, for real fast, we actually get like an eight sigma candidate every 10 seconds or something like that. So this, this is less than eight sigma, it looks like. I don't know, but okay. it would be hard to identify. Just a simple question: Are yeah. uh, parts and aspects in the same band? I see. They're just the uh, same band. That's a good question. So, yeah, parts runs from twelve hundred to fifteen hundred. Mm -hmm. So about the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looks like aspects a little bit longer. Yeah. Um, can you say anything about the time variability or lack thereof of the system source and the polarization or lack thereof? Yeah, there's a lack of polarization, about 30%. It's a very faint source, so we don't have very good limits on it. Um, and variability, the number is along the lines of 10%. Variability is minimal. So it's not, not fading or grinding. It's a problem. Over like an ADM does. What's that? Over what time takes on you? Um, so this was in the Chatterjee publication. Over months. Oh, that was yeah. But since then, uh, yeah, since then we've we've only had spotty observations of it, and it's been along the same lines. So, yeah, two hundred, two hundred ten. You mentioned earlier the self absorption term. Was that something that are there observations of that, or what was that? There's yeah, we have a PMRT observation. Okay. I mean, this is part of the repeater for these hot and thicker spots that now they just take the repeat the data. So the repeater can be one to take care of. There's an increase in the frequency and kind of the rest of the Okay. Yeah. I see that. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah, so the fractional, this is fractional bandwidth off of. I really want to make clear that not all the part that is affected is structure, the many are broken. From the repeater. Oh, from the repeater. Yeah. Yeah, what fraction of our broken? 
I'd like to comment about angular resolution, obviously, you know, but the, the, the key discriminating power was the number of events per year in different experiments. I think the one to highlight is the one that Paul showed in his, put in early on in his plot, which is the um, Chime Algonquin baseline. Yeah. We're talking about a milli arc second, I guess, over there. And again, our forecast event rates actually are non zero. So our forecast event rates are. Um, <coughs> It is, it is phase based even below the bottom of the plot, which could be interesting if you want to localize things like the HST in which yeah. many are second accuracy. You know how it compares to the faster rate? So well, it's, it's multiple per year, and that's the best, best I can right, right. forecast in this instance. And uh, meaning, yes, yeah, it's long zero, meaning there will be events that are blindly localized to, um, again, it, 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 a, few, a few more of the magnitudes. Um, of angular positioning, so that's a, a different regime. So you can ask about you know, the, the region within the galaxy. So I think, as we say, two things. One is to know which galaxy it's in, and then the next question might be where in the galaxy. And the where in the galaxy really requires the LBI case lines. Yeah, and I, I should have said that, that um, the, um, the really great uh, uh, localization for the HSP image here, you know, we, we had a 0.1 arc second localization. I guess that's probably this red region, but there was a Miller second localization with the EVN that gave gave a very very good precision, and you could measure that it was slightly offset from this um, from the center of this star forming region. So yeah, you can do some. They actually detected what they thought was scatter broadening to angular scatter broadening. Okay, maybe we can move discussion for uh, later. Let's thank Sarah again.